I had been given the task of picking a place in the high mountain country in the western part of the United States to photograph the bird and animal life for a TV series. I was going to spend the entire summer observing and studying the different animals. Then I was to give my opinion about the wildlife and conditions in the high remote backcountry. I also had to write several stories for a hunting magazine. The area that I had picked for this assignment was the very beautiful but remote and sometimes extremely rugged thoroughfare country. This wilderness area, where no mechanized vehicles of any kind are allowed to travel, is found north and east of the famous Jackson Hole country in Wyoming. There are several trails into this high country. The main ones are well defined and easy to follow. But for my purposes, I wanted to get to areas where few, if any, people ever get. I had made one trip already a few days before, bringing in some 230 pounds of food, most of which was dehydrated. When you've been in the saddle 10 or 11 hours during the day, it sure feels good to get down, stretch your legs, and rest a while. It's nice to relax for a while, but uh, there's a lot to do, so I guess I'd better get at it. The place I'm heading for is far beyond these mountains, but heavy drifts of snow will probably keep me from getting there for at least several weeks. The first thing, of course, is to get your camp set up and get things organized. The wind can blow pretty hard up here at times, so I always try to get my tent set up in a thick bunch of Quakers or other trees so they can act as a windbreak. Close by is a cold stream that is almost always nice and clear, even in the spring. Now that the horses are pastured and everything is put away, I ought to make a few conveniences so the camp will be a little more comfortable. After I removed his collar, Homer, named after the town in Alaska, finds a shady spot and, as usual, relaxes. I figured a table of some sort would be nice in camp, so I set out to see what I could do about it. After resting a while, Homer decides to see what the country looks like. As busy as I was, I never even saw him slip away. Down at the bottom of the hill from our camp was an outcropping of rocks we had passed on the way in. Looks like a good place for a bobcat or a coyote to stay. Old Mother Coyote must have thought the same thing because she was living there in a small cave, raising a single pup. Now you know the old saying, when mom's away, the pup will play. The only trouble is, it's no fun to play alone. You get tired of poking around in the same old holes day after day. There surely ought to be something better than this to do. Up till now, this little coyote has never been very far away from home, but today was the day to see what lived on the other side of that hill. Homer headed straight for the rock pile. He must have smelled something when we came by earlier. The little coyote didn't seem to know what the big world was all about, or which way to go. Homer didn't know whether to take another nap or just keep looking around. Meanwhile, back in camp, I'm still trying to get that tabletop started.
Well, looks like Homer's all fired up now. Must be on the trail of that coyote. He's only seven months old, but he's all hunting dog. Too bad for that coyote if he catches him. Oh, there he is. Look out, coyote. Well, at least I thought he was a hunting dog. And the little coyote says, hey, wait for me. Looks like Homer's going to find himself another shady spot and uh, take it easy again. But uh, little coyote wants to play with her newfound friend. But it looks like he would rather lay than play. Maybe if I chew on this end, he'll move. Will you play if I stand on my head? Boy, I just don't know about you. You're not much fun. I'll bet if I bite your tail, you'd move. See? Well, at least you got up. Maybe I can hold you up. Oh, not again. Maybe you'll play if I do a somersault for you. Boy, I'm sure wasting a lot of energy on you. Looks like little coyote could play forever, but Homer figures that he'd better get started back to camp. That's not the best looking tabletop I've ever seen, but uh, it'll do out here in the wilds. The two young animals seem to enjoy each other's friendship, but now it's time to part company. With the little coyote heading back to her den, and Homer heading back to camp, I'll bet that little coyote was thinking, that's one of the funnest days I ever had, even if all he did want to do was sleep. Now we'll get that tabletop put into place and tied down solid. That'll make a real big improvement in camp. We'll take a few branches off to make... Oh, was that Homer? Oh yeah, here he comes. Well, it's about time you got back. Come here, Homer. Come on, I've got a little present for you. This will help to keep you from taking off anytime you want to. As the days went by, I tried to work with Homer and train him as much as I could. A lot of the times, though, I went by myself. He sure didn't like being left alone at all. This part of the country has many different species of birds and animals, which you can run into almost any time. Now, there's one of the fascinating birds that you'll see up here. A sandhill crane. Let's just be quiet and watch and see what happens. Sandhill cranes are quite large, usually standing about five feet in height. Normally the birds will fly away when they're disturbed. This one sure is acting strange. The only thing I can figure is there must be a nest close around. 
Oh, now, wait a minute. What was that? Up to my left. Oh, there's a little movement. There's something going through that sagebrush. Hey, let's see what it is. Oh, yes. There's your answer. Not a nest, but the baby crane itself. Looks like mom wants her baby back. We'll hurry and turn it loose so she won't get too upset. Dogs like Homer would instinctively want to chase this chick. That's why he'll stay tied up until he learns to obey commands. One of the reasons I brought Homer along this summer was for his company. Also, I wanted to work with him and teach him to retrieve and to obey commands. A dog running loose in the wilds in the spring, or one that will not obey commands, can be very destructive to nesting birds and their young, and also with newborn animals. One of the first things I teach a dog is to not be gun shy. Talk gentle to them and start shooting with a cap gun. They also should be taught to sit and stay on command and immediately stop chasing a bird or animal when called off. We will go through a lot of sessions like this during the summer. To enjoy the beauty of this unspoiled country is a real blessing for anyone. To watch a fawn deer or an elk calf being born, or to watch patiently day after day until the eggs in the nest hatch, helps a person understand the wonders of nature. You also realize that because of yourself and other people, this beauty can be enjoyed forever or completely destroyed. The beautiful and graceful trumpeter swan was one of the species that almost became extinct because of man's desire to hunt these birds without controls being set up. At one time, there were only 69 of these magnificent birds left alive in the world. It has taken a long time, but being under complete protection, the birds have increased until there are now several thousand, many of which can be seen on these high mountain lakes. Every few days, I would return to this lake to watch the birds and take pictures. There's a nest directly behind this swan. There are four large eggs in the nest. Each is almost five inches in length and weighs over one and a half pounds. During the day, it's quite unusual to see both of the swans near the nest at the same time. Usually, one sits on the nest while the other spends its time on the open lake feeding or leisurely floating around. I return to the lake day after day. The weeks passed, and after such a very long time, I came to the conclusion that the eggs were not fertile and were not going to hatch. I had been away from the lake for about one week watching other wildlife, and upon returning one morning, I saw at the far end of the lake a very beautiful sight. This is one of the sights of the great outdoors that gives much pleasure to both young and old alike. A beautiful bird, once on the brink of extinction, now finds itself safely perpetuating its species. Even though it has always been protected, the bald eagle, whose wing spread may exceed six feet in width, declined in most areas in the latter part of the 1960s. They have held their own pretty well in this high mountain country, but even though there were four eggs laid in this nest, only one hatched. 
It thrilled me to watch the baby eagle grow and mature during the summer months. But later I was to learn that while this one eagle was being raised, some 700 eagles were being killed by ranchers and hired hunters from helicopters in the eastern part of Wyoming. Sometimes it just makes you wonder about people. Have you ever been walking through and found a discarded moose antler like this one and wondered just exactly how the development of the antler took place? An adult bull moose is a magnificent animal and a much desired trophy by the hunter. The antler you are looking at here is from an animal that was four or five years of age. It's fascinating to follow the growth and development of the antlers of these huge animals. There have been many movies made showing the hunting and shooting of these big game animals, but very little has been said about the development of the great antlers that make them such a wanted trophy. Most of the large moose have lost their antlers by the last of December or the first of January. After a short interval, the growing process starts all over again. These antlers have been growing a short while and you can see that they are just beginning to palmate. As the weeks go by, we are going to compare the growth of the moose antlers with those of the mule deer. Notice here, how the antlers of this buck have just started their growth. They appear as a pair of knobs covered with a dark skin from which the bony tissue has developed. The soft hairy skin which secures their rapid growth is known as velvet and its accidental injury affects the development of the antler. Most people do not realize that the antlers on moose, deer, caribou and elk are grown completely new each year. During the spring and summer months, the new antlers develop, and by fall they have completely hardened and are ready for the animal to do battle, if necessary. Several more weeks have passed. The antlers have lengthened until they are about to make the first split or branch. A mature bull moose will weigh six or seven times as much as a deer and will consume as much as 60 or 70 pounds of vegetation a day. Here you see the continued growth and spreading or palmation of the antler. In another month, the antlers of the mule deer have branched a second time. He's gonna be a real nice buck. The antlers on this buck will probably be typical of a mature mule deer and have four points or tines on either side. Sometimes because of injury to the newly forming antler, and maybe also with the combination of old age, some deer will get many points on either side. The most I have ever seen was a total of 54 points on one old buck. Moose are the largest members of the deer family. The animals are browsers, which mean they prefer to eat tender shoots twigs and leaves. Deer antlers normally stay round and form points. Here you can see the continued widening of the palms on this nice bull. These are some excellent close-ups to show you the brow tines or points forming on the front of the antler. Also the palmation and the so-called velvet skin covering you will also notice that the bull is browsing on those tender vines and leaves. Something else has been developing during the summer months too. Yes, the calves are now about two months old and are well able to keep up with mom wherever she goes.
And if they have to, they can really pour it on. Hello there. The slow, easy stride of a moose helps it to cover a great deal of ground with little exertion. Most of the time, the cows will only have one calf, but on occasion you might see twins. I remember a fellow once saying that the reason a moose calf is so cute is the fact that he is really quite ugly. One of the favorite feeding places for a moose is a shallow pond or lake. Some of the young water lily sprouts have not yet reached the surface, so mom has to do a little snorkeling to get at them. The youngsters will feed right along with their mother because they have no fear of water, shallow or deep. On different occasions, I have had people ask me if I had ever seen animals actually show emotion or real affection one for another. I'm going to let this scene answer that question. Can't you hear him saying, gee, mom, you sure are funny looking, but I still love you. Most of the time, I wandered around on foot, and I really haven't been very far from camp, but occasionally, I would ride Job up to the passes and see if the snow had left so I can get through into the higher country. I always bring Homer along on these jaunts, and, uh, and usually, we have a pretty good time. We checked several canyons, and I figured that we'd be able to get through in at least a couple of weeks. There's no sense wasting the day after riding clear up here, so we'll find us a good sloping snowdrift and have some fun. I'll just put on a pair of those sneakers that I brought along to wear around camp, the ones with the slick soles. By the way, who says you have to be a kid to enjoy the companionship of a good dog? Finally, you've tuckered yourself out to the point where even throwing snowballs starts to become a chore. So you just sit down and enjoy the clean, unspoiled beauty all around you. While you're sitting here, looking, you remember that not too far over those mountains to the north is a fantastic place to visit. The place we have come to is just north of the Wyoming border in Montana. The movement of glaciers many thousands of years ago helped to carve and mold this fantastic country. 
At the head of the canyon that you have been looking at is the remains of a very unique glacier. Its name, Grasshopper Glacier. Hundreds of years ago, an apparent migration of grasshoppers was trapped in this basin, covered with snow and eventually frozen in solid ice. I have just spent two and a half hours walking the last nine miles to the glacier. Sometimes you can get a four-wheel drive seven of those miles, but you still have to climb the last two up and over the mountain to get to the glacier. I've made several trips up here, and this particular time, the glacier was more exposed than I had ever seen it before. It does take some work to locate the grasshoppers. Most of the time, however, when you find the right spot, you will see them right under the surface. On my first trip up here, I packed a pickaxe and other heavy equipment, but I soon found that locating all that you need to remove them from their icy tomb. If the preceding winter's snows melt rapidly during the summer and leave the exposed portions of the glacier, as you see here, you have little trouble in finding the grasshoppers. I spent about two hours in nature's icebox, and these are the specimens that I found, which will be taken to the university for study. Some 400-year-old fish bait. There are many fascinating places to visit in the high mountain country of the West, and one of the most unusual is Grasshopper Glacier. Not far to the east of where Homer and I were playing in the snow is another fascinating place to visit. On some of the walls in this canyon, are the ancient writings of a people who lived in the area some 2,000 years ago. There are many Indian writings to be found throughout the West, and most are considered to be in the neighborhood of from 300 to about 900 years old. The writings you see here are thought to have been made between two and 3,000 years ago. These figures, or symbols, are very different from other pictographs and petroglyphs found in the West. Very few actually look like they represent people. However, this one might take exception to that rule. Archaeologists tell us this is not a bird, but it is called a bird woman. The figures you see here, like most dead writings of the world, will simply have to be guessed at as to what their interpretation means. I assume this would represent a person holding something in their hand. This definitely represents a bird, probably an eagle. Of the many writings found in this canyon, this is the only one that has been deciphered. This petroglyph tells the story of the death of and mourning for a great medicine man. He is shown at the extreme left wearing buffalo horns upon his head. Standing over his body, another medicine man may be seen, praying and mourning his death. To the right appears a person crying, probably his wife, with the dots representing tears. To the right of the crevice, we see the tribe mourning the death of this great man. Among the figures are the chief, medicine men, bird women, and other women mourners. All their arms are raised in prayer to the gods. To the extreme right is a blanket and several bags which were given as gifts 
to those persons who mourned the death with the loudest cries and showed the most grief. The custom of giving to mourners is still carried on today on some reservations. The medicine man was no doubt famous and of great value to his people, or this picture in all probability would never have been recorded. These petroglyphs were put here by a group of people known as the Sheep Eater Indians. This carving is about six feet tall. This is one of the most interesting petroglyphs I have seen in the area. At first glance, the large figure to the left appears to be a person. Can you see any similarity? On close inspection, you will find that it is actually a map showing the lakes and trails found in this very canyon. It's fascinating to study these works. Maybe we'll see you up here sometime. One day I was setting up my camera to get some pictures of flowers and unusual vegetation, when much to my surprise, I heard a shot. It was a long way off, but generally in the direction of the new camp I had just made up here in the high country. Then a second shot. Apparently, I wasn't the only person up here. Bear are the only animals that can be hunted this time of year. Maybe it was a bear hunter, and then again, maybe it was just someone shooting at a target. He setting up the camera, took the pictures I wanted. Indian paintbrush. Fireweed. Incidentally, this is a weed and not a flower. It is usually the first vegetation that grows after a forest fire. This is where it gets its name. And other attractive flowers. It was now several days after I had heard the shots. I was working around the new camp, cleaning up things. I had made a new kitchen table and cabinet and had decided to oil and clean the rifle that I had brought with me, but had not yet had out of the case. There were a lot of things that needed doing in this new camp, so I just puttered around and did whatever needed doing. Homer was, of course, just relaxing. Then all of a sudden his mood changed. first time he had ever acted like this, and apparently there was something out there he didn't like. Homer, what's the matter? Come here, Homer. When I called him and he went right past me into the tent, I wondered what could be out there to make him act this way. I figured I had better take a look around, but I was going to play it safe because there are grizzly bear in this country, and I didn't want to come face to face with one of those fellows without something in my hands. I'd load the gun and then take a careful look around. I made a big circle around camp, but I never saw anything. Mm. 
then I saw it for crying out loud, a baby bear. No wonder Homer got so upset. Little bears, you know, smell the same as big ones. Hi, fella. Come here. Come on. But uh, babies have mothers. I wonder where she is. I headed back to camp. It took a while to find them in that junk, but one thing I learned to bring along on these trips, especially in the spring, was a couple of baby bottles. No, that's, uh, that one's too little for this job. Better use the regular sized one. I'll put in some water and then some of that very valuable canned milk. Maybe the poor little guy would like that. I thought he'd like that milk. Hey, not the hand. Oops. That poor little guy was about half starved. He's sure doing a job on that bottle. Hey, bring it in a little ways. Don't you know how to feed a baby bear? Wow, wow, his claws are as sharp as needles. We'll put some gloves on and uh, take you over by camp. Wow. If you're going to live in a tree, then let's make it a tree right in camp. My first battle scars with a bear. I kind of got a little scratched. I was very careful the rest of the day watching for Mother Bear. I didn't want her making a surprise entrance, but she never showed up. The cub had a full stomach now, and I guess he figured the safest place to be was clear up in the top of that tree. During the next few days, I spent most of my time around camp. I wanted to make friends with the little cub, so whenever I got the chance, I tried to coax him down by feeding him some of that dried or dehydrated fruit that I had. I never tried to rush things with him. I would feed him and then leave him in the tree. I figured that in a few days or so, he would trust me, and then he would finally come down to the ground on his own. There were always plenty of things to do. By the middle of the summer, Job's mane had grown out quite a bit, so I decided to give him a trim and roach his mane. My hair was getting rather long too. I could cut the top and trim the sides a little, but uh, there wasn't much I could do about the back, just let it grow. It can be pretty cold bathing in a mountain stream or lake, so I decided to rig up a warm water shower. I hung the canvas water bag in the tree and figured that after several hours, the sun would warm the water, then I could bathe. I tied a rope to the bottom of the bucket, then put the rope over a limb so that when I pulled, it would tip the bucket. Not anything like the Waldorf, uh, but at least it works.
Let's see now. If I had that rope tied around my foot when I was actually showering, then would leave both hands free. We'll give it a try. I'll run. Whoop. Don't fall down on the shower and break something. It took a lot of patient coaxing to get the cub to come to me on the ground, but that bottle certainly was a good persuader. He soon found out, though, that if he was going to eat, he did have to come to me. Once he started on that bottle, he didn't want to stop, not for anything. Although the cub would let me pet him, he didn't like having his feet touched. How about coming up for air and chewing on this? No? Okay. Do you wonder about a bear being fast? Watch this. The one thing that bothers me is, how can a little 10-pound bear eat 20 or more pounds of food a day and still want more? After feeding him a bottle, I would make him climb up on my knees to get the dried fruit. He still let me pet him, but generally, that was only around mealtime. Yeah, that pocket must be where you keep the goodies. Come on. Must be getting kind of full, I guess. The cub was able to drink from a pan, but I kept feeding him from the bottle so that he would get used to me faster and not be afraid. Now you see it, now you don't. I spent so much time fooling around with that bear that I got way behind on my writing. It's real hard to concentrate on working when you have a real cute little friend in camp like that bear. But now and then, I did manage to get a little done. Out here in the wilderness, you really don't have to worry about shaving too much, but I had just taken a nice shower, uh, incidentally without falling down, and figured that I might just as well scrape off a few whiskers while I was at it. It doesn't take long for a little bear to find out when a can has just been tossed on the ground. Mmm, it's got something on the outside that tastes pretty good. Let's see now, where does that good taste come from? Now, what's that button right there? kinds of goodies if you know how to get at them.
Well, I feel like a new man now. All cleaned up. No place to go. Guess I'll get me something to eat and... Oh, no. Whoever thought that he'd get hungry enough to eat lime-flavored shaving cream? I've seen a lot of different animals this summer, but not too many elk. Occasionally, I would run onto a few in the thick pines. Most of them were cows, like the one you see here. Here's one taking it easy in the shade out of the noonday sun. It must be related to Homer. Once in a while, in the larger meadows, you might see a few elk. These are all cows and young bulls here. The cows in this area are definitely not reproducing. I've seen about 150 heads so far, and only four have had calves with them. In a few weeks, Homer, the cub, and I were all one big happy family, at least for the time being. Homer always headed for a shady spot once he had eaten, but the cub, he never did quit looking for food. How about some tang there? No, not your dish, eh? I finished eating, kind of straightened things up a little, and then I headed out to get some water. I had always let the cub run free around camp, and until now, I've never had any problems with him. It was about 200 yards down a little draw from camp to the spring where I got my drinking water. Occasionally, different animals use the watering hole also. Ah, that uh, looks like a bear was here last night. And a big one, too. Let's uh, take a little closer look at that track. Back at camp, a certain little bear cub was about to discover where all the goodies came from. Well, let's see, what do we have here? Hey, that tastes pretty good. I wasn't too concerned with the black bear in the area, even though there are quite a few. But on closer inspection, I found that this is not a black bear track, but the track of a grizzly and a pretty good-sized one, too. I can well do without a big grizzly for a neighbor. Hey, who turned out the lights? <laughs> Whoops. Well, it was almost empty anyway. Now, let's see, uh, what else do we have to eat here? That grizzly track is from a real big fellow. I hope he's just passing through and not a permanent resident of this little valley. Kind of makes the hair stand up a little on the back of your neck. That white stuff sure tastes different. Kind of dry. Num, num, num. Nothing in there. Maybe there's something else in that sack 
way down at the bottom. No, that same old white stuff. I'll bet he could use a drink about now. Now, if there's anything that'll take your mind off of grizzly bear tracks, it's something like this. Oh, no. Get back here, bear. I'm gonna make a rug out of you when I catch you. If I catch you. Dead blasted bear anyway. Jim saying, I don't know why you're chasing me that way. All I did was have a little snack. I'm gonna get you, Bear, if it takes all day. Uh, maybe it will take all day. Whoops, that's uh, about the end of the line. After using several uh, <clears throat> unmentionable words, and after tearing most of the limbs off the tree, I finally got him back on the ground. I tried to calm him with a bottle of milk. Then I was gonna put Homer's collar on him. Come on now, settle down. This won't hurt you a bit. Oops, oh no. Well, we went through the whole thing again. Up the tree, break off all the branches, get him down, some more milk. Okay, bear, take it easy now. Oh, come on. Not again. Hang on. Well, I finally got him shackled. I've tried to think of a name for that bear for a long time, and after having had him work me over a couple of times, I've got it. Scratch. Yep, yeah, from now on, you're going to be called Little Scratch. I'm sorry, Little Scratch, but that's where you're going to stay until I can teach you some better manners. When most people think of hunting or fishing, they usually think of high mountains and tall pines, lots of grass and cool streams. But North America's fastest and most handsome colored game animal is not found there. Instead, this unique fellow is found out here in the flat country. You'll find an awful lot of real estate like this in the West. Some people refer to it as the wide open spaces but most of the folks that live out here just call it plain old desert. A lot of people like to explore or hunt in the desert from pickups or jeeps, and this is fine. But as for myself, I just like to roam around on the pony and see what I can find. If you happen to be in the desert at the right time, you might be fortunate enough to experience something that happens only to the antelope. The antelope is different from moose, elk, and deer in the fact that it has horns like cattle and sheep do, not antlers like the others. The amazing thing that makes the antelope so unique is the fact that it is the only animal in the entire world that sheds or drops its horns each year and grows new ones. Here is a pair of freshly discarded horns. It is very seldom that you will find them in the desert because small animals and rodents eat them almost immediately. The small animals desire them because of their calcium content. Usually, on the older animals, the tips of the horns will turn white, as you see here. That's a good pair of horns, almost 16 inches in overall length. I'll put the horns in my saddlebag, do a little more scouting, 
and see if we can find some of these very handsome game animals. The best way to locate antelope is to simply move around until you see them, then sneak up on them, or try to. Sometimes this may not be too easy because they have eyesight equal to eight or 10 power binoculars. Occasionally, the animals will stand and let you practically walk or ride right up to them. But most of the time, they try to put plenty of desert between themselves and you. This is the way you and I would see antelope at about 500 yards through our eyes. This is what it would look like to an antelope standing in the same spot. The youngster here with her mother would be about four months old now. Here's a pair of twins Unlike the young of most animals, it's not unusual to see young antelope as far as a half a mile from their mothers. Of course, they're always back in a hurry for dinner. They are the fastest of any North American big game and have been clocked at speeds of about 50 miles an hour. It's very unusual to see big mature bucks with the females and the young during the summer months. Once in a while, you will see the exception. There's, uh, there's one nice buck out in that bunch. See him? Antelope will often frequent the foothills around desert areas and sometimes be seen up in the Quaker groves. Only on very rare occasions will you ever see them up in the mountains. Now here's a couple of nice young bucks. It would be hard to determine if they were legal to hunt because in most states, the buck's horns have to be longer than their ears. What do you say? Now that fellow's legal. And here is a real magnificent buck. Not a real old granddad, but uh, he sports a real fine head. He has an almost perfect set of horns. Main beams straight and high, tips gently turning in. The proper name for them is pronghorn antelope. The name derives obviously from the small point or prong found on the front of the horns one on each side. Nature's very handsome gentleman of the desert, the pronghorn antelope. Between myself, Homer and Little Scratch, we are really devouring my food supply. So I have to turn to Mother Nature to help keep us from getting hungry. There are many streams in this high country, some of which are probably never fished. I'll get the rod together and then find some worms. When you can't find worms, use a grasshopper or a grub from an old rotten log. Ah, there's a worm. And then we'll see what this stream has to offer. Uh, how's that? Got one on the very first cast. Pretty fair trout. I think Homer gets as much fun out of my catching a trout as I do.
Not bad for a starter, eh, Homer? Most of the fish that I have caught in this high country are native cutthroats. Now, let's see, we'll get a stick to carry him on and try another hole. Now, that one's only about seven inches long. We'll uh, throw him back. Now, Homer, leave him alone. Homer, you have to be very careful with fish that you release back into the water. I always make sure that my hands are wet before I handle them. You also have to be careful when you remove that hook so as not to tear too much tissue. There, we'll catch you next year. Oh, there's a nice one. <laughs> Whoops, well. Lost him. Glad I said what I did under my breath. Nobody heard me. There are trout in every hole in this stream. They average from, oh, about seven to 12 inches in length, and once in a while, you get about a 14, maybe a 16 incher. Hey, that's uh, another nice one. Not the real big ones, but man, they sure are good eating. Now we've got to play this one and keep him out from under those logs. Easy now. Whoop, whoops. Oh, brother, is that cold. Oh, man, as, as Robin would say, holy melted ice cubes. Well, at least I didn't lose the fish. Oh, all I gotta say is sacre bleu. Catching these fish is as easy as falling off a log, or uh, should I say, falling in the creek. Homer? Well, about one more and we'll have our limit. This one will make the limit. One limit of fish and one quick bath, all done up in less than 20 minutes. Not bad at all. Well, Homer, what do you say? Let's go have some lunch. Ah, looks pretty good, doesn't it, Homer? You're gonna get your nose burned. You uh, better get over here. Come on, man a boy. Man, doesn't that look licious? You're allowed six fish a day on your license. That's two apiece. Fine for Homer and I, but uh, I think the bear figures, they should all be for him. Share and share alike. Of course, the bear first. And he says, come on, hurry up. My turn doesn't come around fast enough. Hey, just the fish, not the fingers. Homer's the gentleman, always waits his turn.
have a little water here and well for crying out loud bear you want my water too I've been away from home a couple of months now mm -hmm. and you might say I'm getting uh, a little homesick there's a song I know that really fits the occasion You can see why I get my fighting done. Rock a bye, baby, in the treetops. Every time I get close to him, he attacked me. Well, no. Uh, I guess he just wanted a partner to dance with. Well, if you're not going to feed me or dance with me, then I'm just going to pout. Most of the lakes up here are very cold. But uh, by the afternoon on a hot day, though, the shallow water around the edges usually warms up a little. Come on in, Scratch. Water's fine. Bear are natural born swimmers, but little Scratch wasn't nearly as fast as Homer. Sometimes he would go for the stick, but most of the time he would just go for a swim and then head for shore. He came close to getting the stick that time. Talk about cold water. Wish I had your fur coat on, Scratch. 
Well, I'm getting hungry. I'll, I'd just like to go and get something to eat. Sure that Scratch won't object to that. No, I didn't think he would object to a little food. Come on now, let's share with Homer. Man, that swimming sure makes a fellow hungry. I thought I'd get to camp and get me something to eat, but uh, as long as there's anything to eat here, then Scratch is the one that's going to do the eating. Want any more, Homer? All right, Scratch, remember what I've taught you. Gentle now. Atta boy. Here, he doesn't want it. I'll eat it. We got back to camp. I changed my clothes, and now it was my turn to eat. There is a big decision that I've been putting off that will have to be made pretty soon. I'll be heading for home in a couple of weeks, and the problem is, what do I do with a little scratch? He has learned to depend on me for most of his food. If I turn him loose, will he be able to make it on his own? Or should I take him home with me? If his mother had been alive, she would never have left him at this age. Well, I still have a couple of weeks to make that decision. But what should I do? A couple of days later when I went to bed, it was raining. When I got up the following morning, there was a light snow on top of the mountains. This is when I like to look for game animals. By now, the antlers on most of the game animals have hardened. The big bulls will be starting the rut pretty soon and be looking for some cows for their harems. When the bull elk start bugling, then is the time it becomes quite easy to locate them. There's one bugling up on the side of that mountain someplace. Oh, there he is. Oh, man, what an animal. He has a tremendous set of antlers. He already has his harem, too. Let's see, there's eight, uh, nine, 10, 11 cows and four calves with him. Oh, boy. What a magnificent animal. Some of the younger bulls, like this one, have not yet started to try and round up harems, but it won't be long until all of them are out looking for the ladies. A nice five-pointer. He hears that challenge from another bull, but uh, he's not quite ready to accept it yet. He seems to be more like Little Scratch, more interested in filling his belly than chasing the ladies. There are three species of moose in North America. The largest are the Alaskan Yukon, the second species is the Canadian, and the smallest is the Shearest moose found in the western part of the United States. This big fellow hasn't lost his velvet yet. Here's a couple of fair bulls. I want to acquaint you with a fact that most people do not know or even think about. As I have already stated, moose, elk, caribou, and deer belong to the same family. There is one main difference between these animals' antlers, other than the fact that while the other animals' antlers are round with points, the antlers of the moose flatten or palmate with points. Can you see the very obvious difference? as you look at this bull? Well, with other members of the deer family, their antlers come out the top of their heads, while the moose, the only one, his antlers come out the side of his head. He spotted me, and uh, he may think I have some designs on his lady friend. I think the best thing for me to do is just say uh, adios. After several days of rain and snow, it began to clear. And as always, after the first snows of the season, 
it only took a few days to get hot and very dry again. Usually, when I took off from camp and was only going to be a few hours, or maybe a half a day, I would let Homer and Little Scratch run free. There was a place that I tried to get to at least once a year. From here, it would take almost two days to make the round trip. I didn't want them running around getting into trouble, so I tied them up and gave them a real big feed. I left them with water that would last until I returned and then started out. There are not many places left today where animals are never hunted. By this, I mean a place that is too far away or too rugged for people to get into. I would like to take you and show you one such place. I call it the Valley of the Ancient Rams. As you can see, Homer and Scratch have become good friends over the past weeks. I'm just wondering, though, is Scratch giving Homer a bath or just finding a good place to start chewing on in case he gets hungry? There are hundreds of square miles up here to hunt and fish in or just come and relax. The fishing that I have done this summer has only been on the smaller streams close around camp. The largest fish I have caught has only been about a foot long. If you take time to fish some of the larger streams and some of those lakes way back in the high country, you can catch two, three, or even four pounders without too much trouble. I've been in the saddle several hours so far today and it feels real good to get washed up in that cold water. The pistol that I'm wearing is an old single action Colt revolver that my dad bought in Jackson Hole when he was a kid, way back in the 20s. I've been practicing with it for a long time now. Maybe while we're taking this break, we can see if it was worthwhile or not. Single action means that the hammer must be brought back before the gun can be fired, as I'm demonstrating here, now at regular draw. Now that we have the feel of the gun, we'll put in some live ammunition. Set up some targets and try a few shots. Oh, that's a little slow. Not too bad. Ah, that's better. With a single action pistol, you have to fan or bring back the hammer with the opposite hand if you want to fire more than one shot with any speed. This time we'll put in five rounds of ammunition. Watch close now. Well, I guess if John Wayne needs some help against old Black Bart and his gang one of these times, maybe I can help him out. Enough for playing around. We still have a long way to go. And at the end of this trail, there's a pretty big mountain that needs climbing. We've covered a lot of miles since the first day we started out clear last spring. See the Tetons in the background? The first day out, we were right by them, but now they're almost 70 miles in a straight line from here. We're going to leave Job tied down here. And in as much as we're not going hunting, 
The only thing I'm going to take along is a pair of binoculars because it's a long, long climb from here. When you get above timberline, all you will find is a few stunted flowers and grass. And this is where you will find one of the most desired trophies on the North American continent, the Rocky Mountain Bighorn Sheep. The area you're looking at here is not where the Valley of the Ancient Rams is found. It looks almost the same, but as you will see later, I do not want this exact spot to be found, not by just anyone. If you happen to be up here early in the spring, you might see some of these little fellows. Looks like they have been watching their fathers, uh, what would you say, talk things over? Sometimes in the early fall, you will see a few females in here, but most of the time, they are all rams. Like this one. Oh, you don't think he looks like an ancient ram, huh? Well, what about this one? Now, that's what you call posing for your picture. Now would you call it the Valley of the Ancient Rams? Not yet. Well then, what about this one? Now that one has better than a full curl, even though quite a bit of his horns have been broken off. A man could search his entire lifetime and never see a more magnificent sight than this. There truly are a couple of real old granddaddies. Look out, that one's going to come down and get you. I'm sure I'm the only person alive who knows of this place, and I think it will be a long time yet before I tell anyone how to get to the Valley of the Ancient Rams. Well, I guess Homer and Little Scratch have had plenty of rest the last couple of days. They used up all the water I left for them, and it looks like that bear has certainly worked up a real thirst. How you doing, Homer? I had an elk license with me, and I figured that if I could get one in the next few days, then I could load up and we'd head for home. I let Little Scratch loose so he could run around a little bit, but I left Homer tied up so he wouldn't follow me hunting. I guess Little Scratch headed for his favorite spot over by the big Quaker. He sure loved climbing that tree. There was a drift of snow in the pines behind this grassy spot that he liked too. Apparently, something else liked the area also, an old male grizzly. Look at the claws on him. I don't think Little Scratch realized what he was doing, but he must have moved towards that grizzly. Scratch? Right. 
Scratch! 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 From the sounds that I had heard, I was sure what had happened, but somehow I hoped I was wrong. Oh, no. Poor little guy. Looks like the grizzly did catch him. thing to do. You know, something like this can make a man feel pretty sad, but uh, Homer was the one that really felt the loss of his little friend. Well, I guess that's about all we can do for him now. Come on, Homer. Let's go. Come on, boy. Come on, Homer. I know how you feel. Come on, boy. Come here. Come on, Homer. I don't think you understand, Homer, but this is one of the laws of nature. Where most animals try to protect the young, with bears it's different. The males try to kill them. But don't feel too sad. Remember the twin cubs we saw earlier this year with their mom? She'll be around to protect them. And I'll make you a bet that one of them grows up to look just like Little Scratch. Well, I don't think I want to do much hunting right now. So why don't we get back to camp, get things ready, and uh, maybe we can head out tomorrow. Come on. boy. Let's go home. If any of you are ever riding way back in the high country of Wyoming and come across a little glass jar with a note in it, sitting on the top of a little mound of dirt, never mind taking it out to read it. I'll tell you what it says. The pines are tall. The skies are blue. The water's clear. And my love is true. It'll be hard to find a friend to match. A little bear by the name of Scratch. I'll, I'll long remember Little Scratch.